all of them, this is some of them, this is some of them, and he'll be talking to us about documenting our work. Um, Peter Song Kamwati, a uh, visual artist. I, I work from Limu, we still have a studio in Kiyaku, but I just uh, moved as of uh, January. I'm currently actually without space, so I have a small garage that I'm functioning from, which is a uh, it's kind of uh, quite an adjustment, but getting there. Um, I I've been around the art scene for I don't say a long time because it's like it's relative at time. But I've, I've been around. I've been to most of uh, I've worked in most of the collectives or centers that uh, uh, some of you are in. I know some of you are independent, and. Um, I think what I want to share today is actually, I know I wanted to talk about documentation, but more coming from a personal perspective, because I think it's an issue of concern uh, to any artist practice. You know, I want to say to at this time, but I think over time uh, we've seen, and I think a lot of people are aware that uh, without uh, all this information, there's a lot that gets lost. Uh, but then also, I'm going to be calling me to uh, talking slightly about my work. So the, the presentation is two edged So it has, I'm going to show some of the work that I've done uh, since 2013, uh, very briefly. Uh, if you have any questions, please jump in, because I'll just move straight into uh, a short presentation around documentation. Uh, and I'm happy to see uh, Eric Beatrice um, way also, and anyone else who has any opinions to weigh, because I think it should be more of a discussion and trying to find out what are their appropriate means, which one, which an artist can actually, uh, you know, document, which is basically story, filing away information about your work. And ultimately, uh, just to break it down, is that the moment you take an image, uh, the image you take of an artwork becomes information. So it's not the artwork itself, you know, it's data, it's something that can be stored, can be shared, where need it can be retrieved, you know, it can be kept in person to generations. So, it's been a while since I've done a presentation in a way, so, so I'm, I'm a bit rusty, so yeah, so I'm kind of a bit rusty. So where I stumbled, let's say this is a, you know, it's a, it's, it's all the time. So, you're allowed to be as hard, but also uh, sensitive. You know, I think people want to bring a lot. So, my practice kind of spans uh, maybe mediums, but then since 2006, I kind of got into drawing as a medium. So, a lot of people kind of tend to cluster me within the drawing space, but then also, I also dabble with animation, a bit of sculpture. Uh, a bit of sound actually, uh, which is work that uh, I've incorporated into animation and installation. But uh, a lot of spaces that tend to pay me attention to what I've done, I've always preferred the drawing medium. Um, you know, hopefully it's uh, a shell I'll be able to break out of in time. It will be the first shell I've broken out of, so I'm kind of not worried about that. Because I have a background as a printmaker, and there's a point that you don't need to identify the hands, because from the printmaker. So I guess now you find full safety because of the access to blows, and hopefully uh, we'll eventually get to put us in the axe. So, yeah. Uh, the first image I want to show is part of a series uh, uh, we'll see today is um, around drawing in this media. And that's work that spans uh, that a project in 2013. I don't know. So overall, I have an interest in groupings, the anatomy of groupings, uh, the synergies that exist, the symbolism that groupings are. So groupings being, uh, I think currently I'm looking at crowd and clusters, with a particular focus on uh, people who are waiting for position. So people who are traveling, uh, I think one of the most poignant images that came across was um, uh, in, in the Calais, which is a city uh, somewhere in France, you know, kind of, I think it's the closest link to England. 
you have the uh, migrants who are trying to cross over and getting a chance to go into um, Doha, which is now the Indian side. And one of the most recurring images from uh, mass media is people dressed very kind of lonely, very dark clothes, clustering together in a state of waiting and, and anticipation. So uh, this is part of a series called um, a Monument to a Vessel. So the idea of, um, of a vessel being uh, something that carries us, that can either carry information, carry people, uh, they convey over course. And uh, I, I created this in 2013, uh, kind of towards the end of the Arab Spring, um, the Nazi strike, Jesus strike, Doctor strike. Um, there was this other thing in the US, which was the uh, Occupy Movement, in which was 2012, 2013. But the idea of the collective being the conveyor of course. But then also the spectacle called that is a collective. So when you have a group of people gathering together, um, it's visible. And the reason people come together is so that they can be seen. So I'll give an example of, um, um, you know, Kevin as an individual is not as spectacular as this group, you know. It's Kevin. Uh, and so I, I think, you know, people tend to pay attention when Somebody uses a lot when you speak in one voice, which I think is more fallacy, but you know, that's what it is. And I look at the protest as a conveyor of uh, a course, you know, to specific. So I created the forms where by you're looking at the forms from behind, you cannot identify the actual issue that they're trying to highlight or agitate for. Uh, but then also the position means that you also become, you all face the same direction. So the viewer, and that's also shown in Stevenson, which was uh, sometime last year. And uh, it was the second time it was being shown. So, and um, in the previous one, I kind of, I did it at the first museum where I kind of layered and became the dance group. But in the second instance, I decided to separate the individual elements. So, um, monument to a vessel. So monuments are also kind of um, identifiers of one history in whereby you exist in it. So whereby if someone is able to create and make a monument, they are highlighting one perspective in the perspectives of their friends and also who subscribe to their uh, version of events. So they preserve it. Uh, what's the paper type you're using, if I may ask? Um, I, I've used, uh, it's called aquarel. It's a uh, in water. It's uh, acid-free, trendy grams, aquarel. Which I think is a French paper. Um, I'm a big fan of paper. I've done a lot of work with printmaking to draw in because part of it is that I don't, I don't, I don't view paper as being a sacred material. So I don't. I'm not afraid of making mistakes. If I mess up, I will very easily tear something apart and start on a new. So I think part of it is coming from a background where my canvas used to be quite expensive when I started out. And so you had a, uh, you had a, I don't know it's a culture. People would actually paint over something uh, when they felt it wasn't right. And that, I think, kind of introduced a different aesthetic and feel to the quality of the work. I know people still do. But then also, because of how, you know, stretcher, canvas, paint, uh, I tended to always approach paint because I do have, I started as a painter in a very rigid way, whereby I'm afraid to make mistakes. If I take this stroke, um, then, you know, the repercussions are that if I mess up, by the time I get the next uh, you know, uh, canvas or the next batch of art materials, you know, it's, it's, it's a longer time. So it's, it's paper. Um, I've worked with various types of paper, like the water color paper. One, one of the things, this is part of the documentation, <coughs> The quality of material means that the work has the possibility of kind of um, staying together and staying intact for a longer period of time. Uh, yeah, for a longer period of time. So this was a um, 2014 project. Um, Dan started in Vermont and uh, it's called uh, 
it's untitled, but then it's called Position Series. And uh, this was actually the genesis of it. So it's not, it's not I mean, it's, it's different. The genesis of it was actually Westgate Harvey when I was away. So I was able to in the country. And I think also the people not in the country. I know it's poor. And um, what I did is that I, when I go to the news, I'm going to the dining room and someone says, oh, just someone I'm so sorry. So it's early morning and I keep, and I remember thinking, my sorry says what's happening in the country. So I remember telling him, I don't read my emails until the evening, but I have to go home and so there's all these things. But it also comes from a helplessness, whereby you realize that um, I feel and I'm plugging it was going here, yeah, but then I can't do anything about it. Um, so what I did is I, I remember the Khalid Brown in the Prophet, so he's a, he's a Persian writer, so he, uh, in the Prophet there's a section of where he speaks on prayer. You know, so I come from a Christian background, I do subscribe to Christianity. And um, he speaks about uh, kind of trying to identify prayer as one place in which you meet people with the rise never meet. So the idea of prayer has a communal aspect, regardless of distance, regardless of geographic placement, because it's a shared, you know, you empathize, you feel for, and you try and uh, ask the powers that be to kind of come into play. But then so what we're thinking about how we are living in a world whereby the religion has become super divisive. And I started kind of um, looking at the structure of religions uh, and kind of realized that uh, at the end of the day, you have, in most religions, organized religions, I don't know about um, uh, those ones that are not really of any structure, you have prayer as a fundamental uh, part. And prayer being something that means you're communing with a higher being. So prayer has an intimacy because of that communi uh, uh, the communal aspect, communi co communing aspect. But then also there's, when you introduce ritual to prayer, which is repetitive, meditative, and all that, then it uses the, the intimacy. So in most religions, you'll find there's a ritual of prayer. There's a way, you know, if somebody will say, clasp your hands, the Muslims have the Salat, which has, uh, I think, the five major animated movement, which is just one animation but then different positions. Uh, Christianity has, depending on which branch within Christianity, uh, it has different uh, positions too. So what I did, instead of looking at, um, you have ritual as fundamental, belief as super, super um, kind of divisive, but then the very core of religion, uh, does it exhibit the same kind of difference? So I did a series whereby I was looking at the different positions of prayer in the three principal faiths you find in Kenya organized. So Christianity are at the forefront, Islam follows after, and then I want to mention the third one. So, and it's not Illuminati, so. <laughs> um, and then kind of realizing that there was a lot of similarity in this position. So positions of prayer, um, I would say it's probably more looking at the physiognomy of a very intimate but now highly ritualized uh, process of the organized religion. So I I miss them up. So I am not I didn't they are certain because I was not trying to identify. I was trying to show uh, that there are certain similarities as much as there are all these differences. So but then when you come to ideology or the the belief side, you you are confronted by this Christians believe and the aim of us is what uh, Muslims believe. So, so I just go through very fast uh, because of time. Uh, that was uh, the last part. So I also so drawing as kind of a, a medium. Um, I started uh, in 2013 playing around with the idea of uh, introducing drawing to um, space which is to volumes. So the idea is that uh, uh, one of the things I did was that I, I started doing this metal cutouts that I would actually uh, make a stand for and be able to go around. I think we're not able to go around. We just go on one side or the other. But of course, if you're going to particle physics, you know, it's actually 3D. But in reality, it's a metal plate and there are only two faces you're confronting. With. But then just supposing that within space meant that I was taking drawings off the wall and introducing them into space. So the flatness of the image remains, 
But then the relationship of one panel to the next gives you a volumetric context used to engage and look at the work. So I can actually argue there's a length, width, and height aspect to this because it will exist within either a certain cube or a circle, or a circle or a sphere or a cuboid. So this was a, a piece that I did for a commission at Garden City, so when they installed in the garden. And it's something that I'd like to explore more, but I think um, I think I think the scattered practice, and I'm not saying it's, these are drawings, uh, is I think one of the most difficult practices there is because it's very easy to get things wrong. So those who get it to get things right, they know you're here. Congratulations. But I think it's uh, it's very easy to actually uh, create things and present them, and they don't have power. But then those who are able to crack that seal, you know, and break it, and able to powerfully express and create the goodness to them. So I'm still debating with how to push this idea of drawings existing in space. Um, and uh, you'll see. Um, so my current body of work is, uh, I, I in August last year, I started looking at, uh, and this is you know, kind of carrying on through positions, something I call constellation and sediments. So aspects of mass movement, the idea that people have to move from one place to the next, uh, for whatever reason. Um, the rituals that they have to undergo. So personal process that I have to go when I have to travel. Uh, personal processes that people I hear of, I read about in the newspapers have to undergo uh, in terms of travel. And so constellations being that, you know, the stars have from time immemorial being uh, beacons that guide people from one point to the next. But then the reality is that if you don't know how to read the stars, you'll still get lost. So, but then also there's always that, uh, I think so, uh, our, our cultural definition of stars is something that you aspire to, something that is higher than you. Uh, the other thing is that sediment also has an aspect of layering, so whereby the reality is that you have to exist in. So you have history, you have, uh, your expectations, you know, you have uh, social society's expectations of you, personal expectations, you have the tools that you've been blessed with uh, to guide you as part of your layers. Uh, you have um, the reality of existing, you know, aspects of hierarchies, social hierarchies, economic hierarchies, uh, I think even political hierarchies actually. Because I think a lot of conflicts now you're looking at are basically uh, you have economic and political hierarchies where well, this aspect of dominance power. It's you know so this is what I'm looking at now. So it's very much at the beginning. And uh, I was doing a residence in Segera up north, um, and I realized that um, in the whole landscape, gr grass was a connector. So there's a specific grass up north. I think it's actually pretty the whole it's called the red hot hot grass, which makes some really really good pasture. Uh, grass is always the first thing to grow and the last, uh, the, the first thing to, to grow and the first thing to manage. You know? So when you train grass up fast and everything as follows, it sustains, uh, oh, uh, it's, it sustains kind of a plant and animal life, uh, but then it's super ephemeral. So groupings are super ephemeral at the same time too. You know, they are here and then they will go. And, uh, Tomorrow, if you feel that the course needs to continue, come back and yes, so it's that. Um, so, constellation sediments, uh, particularly look on, uh, so the map of the Mediterranean, so this is actually broken up into five panels, which is uh, the geographic uh, design, I don't use the word, of, uh, it's not a map, it's a design of the Mediterranean, and also the Mediterranean as. I don't know, uh, in, for people who like cakes, uh, you have, uh, they do this much their cakes. So you have the cream that divides one and the other. And so you have a notion that becomes, uh, it's like an enforcer of hierarchy. Uh, it's like, a delay, it, delay, it creates a boundary between uh, geographic north and geographic south. Well, not geographic, but a north and a south. It's not geographic, because they could have asked that. Uh, uh, but then it also creates aspects of class. And the process of moving 
either way is kind of, I think there's a trial aspect to it. So it's not easy, it's not yet. So uh, the Mediterranean coast on the north, um, historically famous for you know, the French Riviera, it's warmer climates, uh, traveling down from the colder north. But then for someone who's on the side of the Mediterranean, you know, go north because you know, it offers us all these opportunities. Um, and there's a part, there's, a, there's a, a personal aspect to this piece, which uh, that somebody has to ask me personally, I'm not going into details. But it also happened at a very pivotal time. Uh, and there's so many four of us. It's a story that I think we all plan. Um, that's Peter Sonkamori. That's part of, uh, part of what I've done. Uh, how do you define it? What document or a document? I, I find for me it's, uh, it's like I don't know any other way. I take pictures of everything I do from during the process, from during the conceptualization of it to the process of creating it to the person of actually showing it. And then I put it online on my own personal blog. That's how I document my. I also do a, a writer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, that, and, and I have a feeling that that's kind of shared. Like it's public, you mean? Or? Yeah, I mean, put on a yes, share. Yes, yeah. it's public in that way. I don't know any other way to do it. Yeah. I mean, is that something that we all can relate to? Mm -hmm. so. Some people don't know it. Work, just see my artwork <laughs> in a way but I also do blog but for me blogging for me is more um, of a process to kind of like document where my, my work is heading or the process of my work and actually over time I can look back and see oh this is where the work started and I think it's very important because sometimes I find at the end of the day when your work leaves your premises your studio or even the country be told for example and you have no record of it and then at some point in time, you realize maybe it, it was the, that body of work that actually kind of like was the most crucial part of how your practice kind of like developed or, you know, took another di direction. But you have no record of it. How, how, how is someone supposed to know you created it? I find it's, it's one of those things that is important. And, then, and I also think that in this day and age, the digital era is better because before we used to document with slides. Any application used to do you, the application had to be a slide. You have to actually. Now that was has been scrapped off. I don't even know whether the design one who actually does that anymore. So, and it was very hard at that time because it cost a lot of money to kind of like get a photographer to come and photograph your work and develop them into slides. But now you can actually document even with your camera. I mean, with your phone. You don't have to. You just have to have an image somewhere for your own for your own sake. But I think in a in a professional kind of platform, you actually do need to seriously consider documenting your work because out there, if you're doing applications, whether it's for residences and all that, that's the first thing that people ask you. Send images of A, B, C, and D because they also want to see how your work develops, how you able to talk about your work, and I think that all kind of falls in the docket of documenting work. You guys take images of your work, yes. and what, why do you do that? What's, what's the personal gratification, share with friends? For me, I think it is why I take my photos of my work is uh, I want to see that I'm going as an artist. Uh, where if I have enough work ethic to go that way, I think that's, that's, that's important. Mine is more of you know, the, the personal or more to share. Uh, personal now, sometimes sharing a bit, but later I want to keep my own. I want to, I want to make a diary probably, a diary of So, application, website, blog? Uh, I'll go with application. 
Ole, they are picking out now. So, okay, what you are saying? I'm saving cable for last. I think for me it's more intimate. I take for myself. If I if I choose to approach, then I will. Maybe if I want feedback on something, I'll just if someone requests to have it. But it's more for myself. Yeah, for my progress, my record, and just because I like it. I mean, our whole archive is now digitized, speaking up, <laughs> so we have a collection um, and also the works are part of and um, they are being documented. So they are kind of digital reproductions of all the works that we have. And I mean, as long as we're in Germany, in Bayern, in the province, somewhere far, far, far away, the communication aspect you were talking about and making art visible, people outside of Byron is very important. So I think it's really a crucial point to um, um, have this documentation not only for the personal record, but to let your art speak, yeah? and also the artworks to each other. And of course, then it becomes also important to not only keep the pictures of the works, but uh, the, not only have pictures of the work, but also all the details on the work, like where it is from, when it was made, who made it, what material it is, like all that, so you can also categorize and find it if you are looking for something but you don't know how it looks like. What I actually <laughs> document is the process. Because it is the process that once the work goes public, I'll never see the process again. So to me, documentation takes a big part in the process of making the work. Otherwise, once it goes public, there are so many people documenting the work. So to me, that part, I, I'm not keen on that. Yeah. I, I have a question. What is documentation? That, that was a... Yeah. I mean, you want to put it out for... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's whoever wants to answer. I mean, what, what is documenting? It's nice to take the pictures and all of that, but is that really documenting? Um, so, I'll, uh, what's wrong with it? Maybe the, <laughs> maybe the quality of the content. <laughs> it might be the project. Yeah. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just, no, they're saying it's a project. I'm just throwing a spanner into that. That's not so blurry. Is it? I don't have my glasses. So, it's my work in my mind. Does that work? The question is what you can see. Um, it's interesting, I, I think also raise a, a very important point. I, when I agreed to do this presentation, I, I just told you know, I, I told them more, I told them, first of all, you know, with a show of documentation. First of all, it comes from a personal um, struggle and a challenge that to this day I do have to contend with. Um, but I, I guess also, as part of my research, I went online. So I, the first thing is finding the, the definition of words. So it's very easy for us to be applied. Uh, and because they're so commonly used, we don't really find what, the, what they really mean. But then, of course, I know that as words well apply, we give them new meaning. So that's how language is always in class. Huh? But I realize that um, there's a very interesting, simple definition which says that uh, documentation is a process of making official. So it's why, you know, so English language borrows documents, I need documents, I don't have papers, papers are always documents. So there's, there's that. Huh? Um, and I kept thinking, how does that apply to me as an artist? How do I make something? Um, it's interesting because when you mention about uh, because uh, because you make public sculpture, uh, the idea of retaining the image, you know, information that carries on as a memory, uh, is not a challenge that you have to contend with. But the process becomes that certain thing. Uh, what's wrong with the image? Beatrice says it's blurry. Well, I said with um, my eyesight. So. Yeah. <laughs> Or maybe the photographer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> should, should you blame the projector? I don't think you should blame the projector. That's <laughs> just saying. The person who took the image. Probably. Yeah. So that image is blurry actually. 
um, it was to get, give it a size of 8,000 good resolution if only we should have done that. Uh, the next slide should have been a proper one. I did it. Uh, it would actually be the size of a postcard. So that's a body of work I created between 2006 and 2008, uh, looking at the construction making process. Uh, and I was looking at um, places. So one of the things I'm interested in is structures, you know, the structural, social structures, uh, the female role, they're here now, they're always changing. Uh, and I think what uh, they do define social structures, but then also they do, they can actually become motifs of. For example, I'll give you an example. The idea of uh, uh, Orange Democratic Movement, the Orange Beat, actually comes in Genesis from the 2005 uh, Constitutional Referendum. So the Electoral Commission of Kenya decides that uh, in order, as a way of civil, ed uh, ed uh, civil education, as a way of educating people on how they can, when you're going to vote, you know the difference between those who are opposing and those who are not. They decide to give fruit symbols to the two sides. So those who are the, prop, uh, the proponents of uh, the proposed referendum in the constitution at all banana, and the banana was green. I remember I was not in Kenya then. And then those who are opposed to that, what, uh, what was being proposed as a constitution, were given the symbol of an orange. Uh, and of course, we know Karen today, and of course, we have a whole movement that comes in after. So it's the power of what? But I remember reading in the newspaper um, a statement by the head of the, that was given to the Labor Commission saying that the reason they decided to choose fruits was because fruits are in quotes neutral. Uh, I'm sure it's all relative, you know, this is all up for debate. Um, when I did this series of work by the end of 2008, uh, then I got approached by God and the other house to do a publication after an exhibition at that. And I was asked, can you bring images of your work? So I took out all my images and sent them to the publisher. And the information I got, I got back was that the images you sent cannot make a book. So there begins my journey in terms of an interesting document. How do you uh, kind of take this uh, information, how is it presented? Um, the artist processes, so the main processes, I think where the, where, where the commission comes in, and Kevin identified on the use of it on uh, the process. But then also, you can also document your research. So you start at the very beginning, so you develop an idea, and you decide this is the issue I'm struggling. And I'm sure that someone is doing public sculpture. We're looking at historical material, photographs of uh, the context of the game, uh, and those, you know, what you can't carry with you, what you can't print, what you can't, you always have a camera and take notes. So not making as part of documentation. Can I just add something? Yeah. When you talk about uh, publishing, yeah. um, and this has happened to me many times, I find that, I find that my work is published. But I don't know who has published. That is what I'm saying. It goes so it's like it goes viral. So you find this person explaining his own story, the other person explaining their own story. So to me that is also publication. Yeah, but I'm not the one who is necessarily doing that. Yeah. I will just add in that. Um, I think I think my life of one of the issues that one of the importance of documentation is uh, it's also kind of a it's a way of storing memory also. So memory process has a memory aspect to it, which is something else. And I think probably violence you have, you have music, well, uh, you have actual networks. I don't know they have a database for that. Um, so the process of uh, writing an artist statement as a way of documentation, valid or not valid? It's valid. Sketchbook? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but just thinking about it's valid. So, sketchbook notes. So, you document when you type your thoughts from sketchbook onto uh, what? Because one, one seems an official, but the other seems very official. I think, I think one, of, uh, one of the 
within the visual arts circle, I think one of the most important forms of documentation is actually the photograph, because you're dealing with visual. Uh, and I'm happy to see uh, Sergei Tonga. You're here. Um, as a professional photographer, uh, as an art photographer also, which is another different space you can actually wait. Um, so you document processes, you document work, uh, tools for documentation. So the tools are the camera, the phone, uh, the word processor, which is... Um, if you're working with the official government document, the typewriter, which is how you get titled in the certificates. So that's official, that, that has power to it. Um, then, different platforms, which are the different tools, would always have different applications. So I had a nice camera, uh, I was very excited. Uh, and when I sent the images, I knew I had taken the digital SLR. And the photos were rejected. So another aspect to it is you have all these tools, but then you have the skills to use them. So it's one thing to take an image for Instagram or Tumblr. It's another thing to shoot a video that will be broadcast on national TV. I mean, I've taken to extremes. I could easily say it's another thing to take an image for a publication. <laughs> So realities, you know, that one has to contend with. Um, so all the tools and platforms are valid, but then at times they're specific, you know, so which is if I was to take an image with my phone, uh, my call at the Quavo iPhone 6S, uh, beautiful for a build. Yeah. I think that was, that was just shooting with the video. Uh, if I use my, uh, which was from the app last, so I have an iPhone 4, so that's a different thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, you, um, so lack of skills means that you need to bring in those who have skills. So which is how I solved the issue. So the challenge was that because some of the work had already left the country, some of it I didn't know who bought. I had to settle for those people I could trace. And those people who, even if they're not in Kenya, were willing to take a piece and frame it, get it properly photographed and send them which, which you need for actually one specific body of work, city colors, part of it, down that way. Um, but then in Kenya, because I realized that I had a handicap, I had to look for someone who could actually now uh, was professional and was skilled enough to take proper photos. Of application. So the project was a book. So the book was a, a book on drawings that I done from 2005 to the two years. And uh, I ended up kind of talking to someone uh, who stepped in and was able to do that. But then, of course, it came at a cost. So that's another reality. I'm just introducing realities now. So realities that you have tools, realities that you have different tools are suitable for specific platforms. And then beyond that, do you have to dig into your pocket or not? Or do you have to go back to school? And at this point, I'm introducing him uh, to learn how to be a photographer. I don't know how long that takes. And uh, does that make sense? You know? So do you have to know everything for you to, uh, in course, make your work official? Yeah. So, Eric Gitonga. And what he says is very true in terms of having the skill set to, to get the photographs that you need. Two weeks ago, I did a shoot for Andrew Mwini for his visceral, for his uh, mirrors, uh, for his M theory, and um, for his scotch stone. And it took us a long time. What, what uh, Peterson says is right, that you may have the tools, yes, and you may think it's just a matter of pointing it at uh, the artwork and taking the photo. but there's a lot that goes into that. Like for Winnie's work, especially for the M theory, he wanted to make sure that the texture on the paper was visible, so that even when you zoom into the picture, you can actually you can actually see the texture. And there's a way that you have to place the lights in order to get that texture visible. 
if you just place the lights um, head on, like for this piece of work, if you place the lights directly in front of it, you're not going to get that. But if you place it to the side, then you will get that. So you have to know, that is something that you have to know. If you don't know that, then uh, like he said, you will take the photographs and you will send them for publication and they'll be rejected. So um, there's the two ways. You either learn how to do it yourself, uh, which takes time, or you pay a photographer to do that work for you. Yeah, at the end of it all, you might find that whether you go the do-it-yourself route or paying a photographer might cost you the same. If you do it yourself, either in terms of the fees that you have to pay for someone to teach you, or the time uh, investment you have to make to, to learn those skills. Alternatively, just pay a photographer to do that work for you, he'll come and spend a day. Like for Andrew's work, there were, I think, a total of 60 pieces and it took us two days to photograph all of them. It's Even for me, I was surprised because this is the first um, uh, pieces of art that had done on a large scale. Usually it had been one piece here, one piece there. And so even for me, I was surprised that it took us two days to do that. But at the end of it all, he was happy with the results. And for me, as a photographer, that once I see an artist is happy with the results, then I feel like I've done my work. Uh, what Beatrice documents her own work? Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm just trying to present two sides to, not two sides, but one of what, some of the alternatives to. So a lot, and a lot of you, I'm sure, do that. Also. So I mean, eventually, you might find the need to pull in uh, people. The other thing, the other thing is that um, it's also documenting, and this is where same thing about tools and platforms as holders of memories. So memories being you're basically, um, uh, you're basically, uh, how do I put it? It's a form of uh, not archiving, and that's a wrong word. Uh, you're filing your practice. So let me take that please. So every image you post on Facebook, uh, in essence, does make your work official because you become an identifier. Um, platforms in which you do this: Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, uh, blogs. And a number of you have blogs here, websites, and those are those that are available. To you. So uh, there are implications to all this. So some of the, I think the the most accessible platforms in terms of uh, where you can actually post and you know, kind of have a catalog in, in essence of your work would be on social media platforms. So which makes them valuable. So just because you don't have you know a T file that in a, a window doesn't mean that you don't uh, take images of your processes where process becomes your focus or, or your final output where that is your focus so as a painter and we have examples of people I think uh, in this room I know Beatrice has a very nice Instagram page Instagram Tumblr no Tumblr anyone you know, else who's doing Instagram Tumblr Instagram, Instagram, yeah, Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. I'm ashamed because some of you are in a uh, kind of fan of Instagram, so, so I mean, Jackie has a blog, no, but you write uh, the, the album, the album studio, which is text, but it's right, is it? Text. Well, now it's just now. It's rambling. It's, 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 it's our website. You need it for a website. So a blog that became our website. Michael Soe, quite active on Instagram. Well, the, the thing about blogs nowadays is that they have a template that allows it to look like a website. That you can actually key in a bound portfolio and all that. And, and most of them are actually free. So you don't have to worry about going to a web developer to kind of like design one for you. You, have, you just have to kind of like look at the blog that actually has the, uh, the things that you need. And so sometimes I feel like the simpler it is, the better, because the idea of the blog that actually resembles almost like a, a website is you want the work to, to be seen, so you document your work. Both the the Im it's not just about the image; it's about also your CV, what you've been up to, what you've been doing, and all that. Because I find like mo most people tend to okay, we, we document and we take, constantly take photographs, but people, your your CV is uh, is so outdated. You'd be like if someone told you could you send me your CV, you'd be like sitting down and wondering okay. What have I done in the last five years? So for my question is, why don't you write this down, this down while you're doing them? 
like you can have a show somewhere, write it down so that at the end of the day, if someone wants to ask for that information, you, you have it at hand, you know. So, but for me, I find like blogs, especially nowadays, I wanted to actually have a web designer develop like a website for me. And then I, I, I bumped into ta uh, the Tumble uh, blog that actually has templates that it, it depends on who, who's kind of like, you can, that those that actually, you can pay for them, but most of them are actually free. So if, if it's the, you want a free one, you actually look for one that is, goes uh, with the criteria that you need, yeah. And this is for you because you used to have a website and apparently it's normal. <laughs> that's, another, that, that's, another, and that's another aspect I'll, I'll bring you. Now, uh, one of the things that I had a website, I think I had probably, I would challenge anyone to say, not the first website of anyone in this room. And none of you know that I used to have a website. So the reason being that I had the website on for a year, I thought someone, a uh, designer, who came in and also became the administrator for a whole year. But then I realized that the hassle of having to constantly uh, update stuff and give you material, and having to learn how to, uh, to get it. Because I used to pay him, so I put up and I thought, let me try and learn how to do this. Uh, kind of, I felt, maybe I was lazy, but I felt like it took me away from the studio. So after one year, I kind of thought, I don't need it, and, all, and you know, that, that was it. But then some of the spaces that I've been working with, which is uh, in one of the galleries that I work with, at Love Africa, have artist pages. That's another platform also. And because they are on an administrative side, what happens is that it, um, when they need information, all they need to do is ask me for information and update my CV and update uh, uh, images where they need to do that. And so, in a way, I, I partially cannot depend on their efforts to have a profile. Uh, so the people will ask me, uh, Peter Song, can you see your work? And I tell them, go to this space, go to the next space, and you'll see what I've been working. Um, and these are, I'm not trying to excuse people, but I think these are valid, the valid result is why one wants to get someone else to do it for you. Uh, if you can manage it, I don't know how you manage your time. So you have an administrator, how you? I do, so like, well, mine is, uh, so the guy I got from the web developer, and then, so he, he pays my, because you have to pay a certain fee, a delay, yeah, to continue with it. and then, so he just showed me the back end of it, so uploading stuff, editing, all that, and I mean, I did uh, multimedia design anyway in school, so I kind of had a, I figured it out. So now I just update it to myself. If I need to take out something and add something. And then the other part of the blog, you can link it to a blog which opens up to another page. So it could be a Tumblr, it could be a blogspot or a WordPress. So you just put the link there. It's actually quite easy. And I don't have to pay much. And the other way also. And the other way also. Someone coming in from Tumblr and Instagram exactly. can actually link it. Exactly. And it links to your social media pages, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I could give you his name. Mm -hmm. So I won't exactly what I need. <laughs> so, um, the, the thing is that I think ultimately, I, I think one of the things I noted is that we cannot remember everything. And uh, you cannot remember all time. I think one of the things I, I don't know who, who said that, but the idea is that you can don't remember everything across time. You know, I think you're the most clear you are is in the present. And also those things that impact you greatly. But there's something that I think you've done that unless someone jokes your memory, or unless you go back into where you compile all that information, um, you probably, you know, kind of, uh, you, you, you probably kind of uh, wouldn't be able to recollect clearly and coincidentally. So taking photographs of artworks is, let's say, the principal aspect, but then there's also information that accompanies that. So what are the details of what you've done? I don't know. Would you remember Beijing Resell who sold four years ago? Yeah. You would remember the painting, but chances are the sizes are scarce. Yeah. It was for an image of the one. I can't get I want to say who cool it even so you talk to yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things recently I came across this document, uh, which is uh, 
I was actually making an application and uh, I came across this document presentation. It was actually a very basic word document that um, that kind of allowed me to insert photographs this this whole format. And uh, this was for my residency I'm applying for. So and uh, I kind of realized I could actually borrow it, you know, in quotes and use it as a system of cataloging my own. You know it does that you know you're able to have the title, the year, uh, the medium, the dimensions, and a small synopsis. So statement about the one. Basically, so this is something that I'm appropriated that's been used for another purpose. Uh, and appropriate as a tool which if I continue if I'm consistent, I could easily have a folder whereby I can trace all this information about them. And I think these are things that you know if any of you is interested in getting into, uh, can send me the template of it, which is not an issue, just copy paste to it. Panda itself. Uh, but the things that so the process of documentation also encompasses all the details, all the sub stories that accompany the specific content uh, artwork that you want. And so if you was to look at this uh, file 10 years from now, I'd probably be able to do a better job of you know, talking about what I've done then uh, than if I hadn't done that. The other thing is that um, you also, there's an aspect of posterity, which is, uh, uh, I think one of the discussions that's been going on is that uh, there's very little written about Kenya. You have that term. Uh, so there's very little material about uh, artists who go ahead of us. I think a lot of uh, the stories, and I've been fortunate to know people like Yeho, you know, who, who can link in some of these stories, but they all exist in the oral language. I don't think in this day and age it is sad. I think it's you know it's insane that that is the case. So if we document work, you know, websites, blogs, you know, uh, Facebook pages and all that, it means that someone who wants to look back into this period, the time that you existed, and the time that you're going into, will be able to do that in a more effective way. Um, I think uh, there was a project which was done uh, years back. Uh, can, the Cannes project at the National Museum. Uh, I don't remember what the Cannes is an acronym for something, but uh, Budia Minor, so if you get some Budia Minor, you'll be able to highlight this. But we're actually taking uh, videos and text and, and sounds and music of some artists, but also predominantly communities for the National Museum of Kenya. And they eventually presented it as a sound interactive thingy, which I don't know which way to the can project. But I think um, the, the digital, the online platform is probably a better place to kind of uh, store these things. One of the things I had was also emails, so very basic. The idea that uh, I think one of the most basic, very, very low technology ways of uh, preserving information is uh, somebody would say, can you send yourself an email? You have that. So, so the idea that if I go back into the mailbox, you have not deleted emails. I can trace images that I sent to Beatrice or Kevin or because usually they do have them. And for some of this work, like the last, uh, the book that we just saw, I was actually able to retrieve this. Uh, I said the second one, obviously, this should be I was able to retrieve that from. Uh, from an email that sent to a dealer in the UK. Um, so I So that image I retrieved from an email that sent to someone because I hadn't documented it. And that has happened to me a couple of times when I, I forget to take work. There's a rush to have a show down and a Rakisha take to the gallery. Then the next thing you know, it's hanging on someone walks behind the place. So I think ultimately the challenge is that we pull in the services of those who are able to, 
where you need to learn the skills, let's uh, learn the skills. Um, uh, Sylvia Kiamios uh, was supposed to be you know, she was supposed to be a biotechnicist. And uh, there's another aspect to how you document performance installation. Uh, is it process? Is it okay? So that I can't, uh, Jack is here. <laughs> how do you document? I'm actually going to ask Siri about that. Yeah, because I had a discussion. Yes, I'm invited to the I imagine we will do an installation, which is part of the performance. How do you want to go to space? For installations, I can talk about them. Okay, I can do performance. I do video, that's the easiest. So there's photographs, and you can document through video as well. And then depending on how you want to present it, so maybe if it's a live performance, always get somebody, even if it's not a professional, to at least document. And now we have phones that can do all these kinds of things, that can document in real time, you can upload, you can do all these things. And then also there's text. Have somebody write about it. I I can write, but there are people who are really, really good at this kind of stuff. If it's a friend who you know who can write, at least sit with them and explain to them and let them capture that in words. Um, the other thing I saw was like streaming or something, live streaming, but that's like you have good internet or um, something like that. Does it does it store? It does, it it does, does yeah. It does. Uh, installation is pretty much the same thing. Like video for video photography. Video photography text. Yeah. So sculpture has the multi sides to it, which also see the installation. Some installations mm -hmm. do. Like, um, I know with the Bolton one, I made a huge mistake with that one because I did not document how it would be documented. Um, ideally, I'd have had a time lapse to show because I had roses hanging from the ceiling and the roses were decomposing, and that was part of the process. So like a performance art piece for them for installation. But what I did instead was I took pictures every day that I went there um, of the roses decomposing. But they're not they're not from the same angles, which they should have been from the same angle. So that's the one thing. I think also the other thing is doing a before and after. Because when you present to work in a gallery, it's complete. And a lot of people nowadays are more interested in the process. So as you do, as you make your drawings, even for the setup of the installation, you do sketches and stuff, unless you're like a pro and you just go and do it at the scene. So those are also very important, the sketches and the drawings, and then document like the process of, you know, like a making of the video or the performance. And then now the final thing, yeah. Like what you say with the roses, a time lapse of sorts to capture the sequence. Composition while it's actually standing in the gallery space. And actually, that applies to many of my installations because my installations, you have to interact with them. So you, the, people will move things in gallery or things will, things change. And I, I should have some way to document that, but maybe I can do this way. If I could, I'd have maybe a time lapse video or I'd have a photographer who goes in and takes a picture of them. And that you can store. That you can store. That you can make sure. But I don't mind. Yeah, but I mean, you ever need it. I think, same thing about retrieval. I think, Kevin, maybe just a pull you in the We've had conversations about what is who we will never see documentation of their work, but they always post. Come again, you're saying artist too? Really? So, as a yeah. classic example of, yeah. uh, of someone who's, who should be featuring very prominently. But because, yeah, know, because it's, of it's not documentary yeah. material, but yeah. kind of allows him to plug into the, the history actually. Yeah, he was actually very private when it comes to documentation and even when it came to work. When he was doing his work, he was very private. When it's out there, he's out of the work. You can't know it's him. Who is Burio? is actually a sculptor. He's the one who did uh, the dinosaur, um, Leaky, and then the lions at, um, at the mausoleum, and then there used to be something at Chester House. 
quite a good job, but that job disappeared, no photographs. Where is he now? Passed home, Passed. some years back, yeah. But that, that tells you why actually people need to document, even if it's not you documenting, somebody else should do it. And actually it's a concern we're facing now, because part of the reason why people might think that the staff doesn't have, Kenya does not have that much artwork, is because we, had, we didn't document it the way that we should have anymore. So maybe that's something we need to change in that. We have the voices that say that yes, Kenyan art does exist and has existed. Um, and I know, like, for example, we know about West African and South African art because we read about it. But are we reading enough about Kenyan art? But it also reminds me that there's, there's one of my work that I bumped into um, at uh, where the Pope's representative stays. So we went there for a visit. I had done the work long before and I had even forgotten. But because I didn't document, I saw it there, but still I could not even take a photo. <laughs> so I keep on regretting why I did not take anything <laughs> that time. But that time I was um, a bit upcoming and I never thought about documentation. So I just thought of the work. I think that is what I wanted to ask because I hear you people say you want to document it for memory and something. Let me throw this like who's not a map, who's not uh, one of visual art. Is do you ever think that your documentation should be for even legality purposes? Is because the sad part is it's good to take videos and and, and, and and pictures and everything, but it's important to write. Because by law, I will tell you something, is that I can prove that your work, it doesn't matter how many times you've actually documented this man, so long as you have not written the process as well. Law takes things written seriously than something just taken. So it's important, most artists don't get our practice. Sometimes it's very tedious to sit down and write about your process or stuff, but it's also safe for you as an artist and also anyone else that can bring anything else you can actually prove that it's your work. So it is a tedious process, but it's very important. When you're documenting your work, write about your work as well. Because then, and yes, about sending email to yourself, is actually, that is the only thing I've ever, I've ever seen in court win actually, uh, someone's right of their work, because they could show their documents as in, he said, just by word, he says, I should send this to myself on October, this and that, and that one you cannot do. So that is very important. That's understood. Yes. I know in the olden days, people used to uh, post something to themselves. So you, you take your sketches, you put them into an envelope, and you post it back to yourself. Because then you have the stamp that says that these are your sketches. Go over there. Well, register at the poster. You register. The main, even if you are sending it to yourself, you have to register. When you register, there's a document that you get that you go with to the post office. And this document is the only evidence that that work is valid and it's yours. Oh, yeah, and another thing signatures. Um, when you put your work, if you just write a signature in a certain way and then you change it, make sure it's changed to that. As, as with the legal document that actually shows, you've changed to your signature. I know that is not true, but does it apply to paintings? I mean, because sometimes I'm not the person who signed my paintings. I used to sign my paintings as Nina, and then I grew that, and now I sign my paintings as Omori. Does that affect my? I had a year where I signed Kamori or whatever. So I was going into Africa and I was doing all these colonial, with all this colonial, with us all. So I know this is more of the hands of this design, Kamori or and probably like 20 other people. Um, the, the thing is that I don't, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know about the Kenyan infrastructure, because I nearly, the style also become an identifier. So, same as process. But there are processes that are patented, that the way you make something, uh, means that it can only be made that certain and no other. Same thing with style. I mean, you have, um, I, I just saw in art news somebody, there was a case on uh, crazy everything, uh, by somebody painted like someone else who was a kind of high profile artist. 
And that gets you uh, soon and uh, the person who was suing uh, won the case based on the true ability of uh, Michael. And you're actually showing Peterson painted like Michael because three years ago uh, in Admin's publication they did print on the cover and painted Michael. Mine is 2016, his is uh, uh, 2013. So ownership belongs to me. I end up paying. Kenya, I don't know. But then one of the other things that we also mentioned, you know, the Vira story. I'm, I'm doing some, doing some research now on uh, Rosemary Karuga. So aspects of people who are falling off the narrative. Because, uh, do you guys know Rosemary Karuga? Let's start with Yeah. Okay, who doesn't know Rosemary Karuga? Okay, good. Who um, knows of Vira? Uh, before Kevin, the end of my life. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, basically, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a real story, because it's part of our history, part of the past, it's part of now. So, Rosemary Karuka, and I, so far, recently I came, I was just going online looking for what's been written. I came across a piece she done, uh, which was in the Canterbury, um, apparently, Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And it was part of our four pieces. And initially, uh, so the first Kenyan woman artist to graduate from Makerere was Rosemary Karuga. Now she lives in Ireland because she's old, so she's doing online actually. And uh, she works in, in uh, she works in Clare, which is in Makerere. I saw her first clay piece at uh, the Murubi collection, if you go to National Market. It's a beautiful kind of leading woman moving about. Amazing work from 1950s. Which is, I was probably going to remember. <laughs> All of us were. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is a piece that I, I just came across this two days ago. And uh, she did, and uh, it was uh, the, the terracotta clay piece was uh, executed in bronze in four parts, which were donated. Uh, and one of them was actually shown in MoMA. So the history of a piece. So can I actually show you MoMA? On this you move, yes, but you have Osmeri Karuka very early. So it's part of the history that because it's not, uh, we, it's not black, we don't share it, and so we completely let it go. And the reality is that we all, it's all transition. Uh, our presence on this earth, in this space, uh, we call the Kenyan activities, is all in transition. Either biologically or by other, you end up, end up becoming a family in a new key, and I can follow the other. But at times I think what has been put down is very easily black one out uh, the greater story. If possible, I mean it's not always the case. Um, there's a lot of more touched on people, which I would have loved to, uh, but I'm not informed enough to touch on. Because I can't give you choices. All I can tell you is that if you can't take a photograph well enough, please talk to someone who can. If you don't want someone to do it for you, ask someone to train you to do it. Any thoughts? What? If you have notebooks, do you have notebooks? Yes. Should you keep what you write? I used to. And I still do. The problem is that nowadays, because I can afford to buy notebooks, I end up having a lot of notebooks. So, so previously, I could only afford one, so there's so much. Like, I have books, I can see all these notes. Sketches, people's telephone numbers, the measurements of the yeah. converting dollars into pension. So that's our.